Welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, brought to you by TheVirtualInstructor.com. And now, let's get sketchy. Hello there, everyone. Matt here with TheVirtualInstructor.com, and welcome to Getting Sketchy Live, the greatest live broadcast in all of YouTube, of course. Thank you for joining us tonight. Last week, of course, we took a break off because it was spring break where I live, and I went with my family out of town, and we enjoyed each other, and uh, I hope you enjoy the people that you love and care about last week as well uh what is getting sketchy first of all getting sketchy is where we usually draw a uh, drawing for you guys within 45 minutes and uh, we try to sprinkle in some instruction there as well and tonight is the actual season finale of season seven of getting sketchy so ashley and i are going to look back on the drawings that we created this season do some quick critiquing of those drawings and then we're going to each choose our favorite from the season and uh, Ashley's sitting right over there. So how are you doing? Tonight? I'm doing great, Matt. Thanks for asking. I hope you guys are doing well out there. I, I missed you guys last week. I thought about it. I felt like there's something I needed to be doing on Wednesday. I was waiting for that other shoe to drop, and it's dropping tonight. So anyway, um, I've been thinking about and reflecting on the artwork that I made over the last season. And um, I like to you know, think about what went well and for each piece, maybe something that I would do different. And so we'll have a little bit of uh, self critiquing tonight. Um, but I think we're, I think that's it. We're ready to get into it. <laughs> now that Ashley is barefoot, um, <laughs> since both of his shoes have dropped. Um, uh, if you are watching tonight live, you can, of course, uh, take advantage of the chat box and post comments, ask questions. They don't have to be about what we're talking about tonight, they could be anything art related, but we're going to be going pretty quickly tonight. Mm -hmm. um, because we have 10 pieces to get through. So these critiques are kind of going to be on the light side, but you're going to get to see all the artworks that we created. Yeah. Now, if you missed any of these broadcasts from this season, I've left links to each one of these lessons in the description below this video. So when we're done with the critique, you can go back through and watch all of these drawings be created for you when these broadcasts were original. Well, not when they were originally broadcast, but you can see the recorded version and uh, yeah. hopefully draw alongside of us as well. Now, if you're new to the channel or if you haven't done so yet, make sure you subscribe and click on that notification bell so you're notified when we upload new videos and we'll continue to be uploading videos here. Uh, even though Getting Sketchy is gonna take a little bit of a break, uh, we will be back, uh, we didn't really discuss this, but June, is that, Yeah, is that I good? think so, that's probably about right. Uh, so we're probably gonna start back around June. Mm -hmm. Of course, if you want to be notified when we start back, make sure that you are on our newsletter list and you can get on the newsletter list by clicking on the link in the description below that says uh, free course videos and ebooks. So not only will you be notified, that will put you on our newsletter list, but you will also get uh, access to three of our course videos and ebooks for free so you can see what our courses are like. And what are these courses I'm talking about? Well, there is a membership program at thevirtualinstructor.com if you didn't know that. Um, it includes a variety of drawing and painting courses on a variety of media and subject matter, including pen and ink, graphite, uh, pastels, uh, just about any drawing medium, any painting medium that you can think of, watercolor, acrylics, oils. We have a lesson for you over there and we have a course for you as well. We also do weekly live lessons. In fact, uh, after this broadcast, I will be starting a brand new live lesson series where we're going to be drawing a jellyfish with graphite. We're going to be using some powdered graphite in that too, so that should be exciting. Mm -hmm. That will be broadcast right after this broadcast at 8 o'clock, but you do have to be a member to access our live lessons. There's also weekly critiques, which are part of the Members Minute and a year-long curriculum for visual arts teachers. So if you want to check out our program, uh, there is a link in the description below this video. You can check it out. Everyone starts out with a week-long trial for free. And after that, we offer a 30-day money-back guarantee. So we want to make sure everybody is happy and uh, learning in our program. So um, with that being said, I think we're ready to get into uh, this critique. It should be a lot of fun. We're going to go through the drawings in the order they were created. Now, this season, uh, we each had a motif, which a motif uh, is kind of a funny sounding word, but motif basically means theme. And uh, my theme this, this season was facial features and and basically drawing faces. Mm -hmm. So I went through all of the facial features and uh, then drew a portrait at the end. And Ashley's motif this season was down on the farm. 
right? That's right. Down on the farm. So Ashley has all kinds of drawings because right. there's all kinds of things. I picked down, down on the farm because there's a lot of, it, it was an opportunity for a lot of variety in case I wanted to kind of change things up, not draw the same type of subject every week. And I actually did um, three animals, which was a little bit outside of my comfort zone, but it still, it still uh, gave me a chance for some variety in subject and also in media. Now, you like drawing animals a little bit more now. Yeah, I do. Actually, I had a great experience yeah. drawing the animals. I think I'm going yeah, to work them in a little bit more. You know, yeah. it's, I do, I've always done a lot of portraits, and it's, it feels a lot like that. Yeah. Animals yeah. have faces, too. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, definitely. You can put personality in right, there. Right. There's, there's a lot of crossover, a lot of similarity from, right. from those. Ma they're all mammals, right? We all right. understand. Well, no, I did draw a bird, but the other two mammals, uh, it's a, there's a, all the features are in generally the same place just different proportions so well the best thing is nobody gets mad if you make the lipstick the wrong shape yeah that's right, that, right. or if they do they can't tell us because right. they don't speak right. uh they, they don't talk to, talk to, to or i don't talk to yeah. animals they don't yeah. talk to me <laughs> <laughs> all right uh we'll switch over to photoshop take all a look right. at these drawings and uh the first one up is going to be my eye this isn't mm -hmm. my eye but it was the the eye that I drew here, mm -hmm. and um, the material I worked on, I worked with a, um, worked on a Strathmore Artigan paper, which is, uh, this particular surface is a gray paper. It's not, this isn't Artigan paper. This was a gray drawing paper. I, I don't know why I said Artigan paper, but uh, Artigan paper, I think it's typically black. Anyway, um, it was a gray surface, yeah. and I used black uh, pencils, which are con kind of a combination of graphite and carbon, uh, which is kind of an interesting combination. But what happens is the shine from the graphite is greatly lessened because of the carbon material in the pencil. So if you're one of those folks that doesn't really like the graphite shine, you might consider using carbon pencils or the pencils that I use. I think mine were, um, I'll pull them out at some point during this process when Ashley's taking a look <laughs> at it and tell you exactly the brand name. Um, but I also use some white charcoal in there as well. I was pretty pleased with this first drawing. Uh, obviously, when you have more time to work on a drawing, all of these drawings are limited to 45 minutes. You can add more details and so on. I kept all of my drawings relatively small this series uh, or this season, uh, but I was pretty happy with the way the eye came out. But I draw, I've, mm -hmm. probably, I've drawn eyes probably more so than any other subject matter in the world. And, and probably a lot of you are the same as mm -hmm. well. So I was pretty confident going into this, this particular one. Um, and I feel pretty pleased with the results. Compositionally, of course, I mean, you know, it's hard to judge these compositionally, but uh, compositionally, I would have probably brought a little bit more of the eyebrow down into the picture plane. Uh, it is a little strange up here at the top that uh, the eyebrow kind of goes off there and there's just a little piece of it up there. But again, this is just a quick sketch and part of this broadcast tonight is being critical. So I am being critical here. Um, I really like the way I handled the texture of the skin over here and right here. Yeah, um, I really like that part. It feels a lot like skin. And I also like uh, the, the handling of the material in the white parts of the eyes. And I say the white part of the eyes because it's really not white they're kind of a, a darker gray we'll call them the light part of the, the eyes. the light part of the eyes i like that so but overall i was pleased with my first drawing the eye um all right and then we'll move on to ashley's drawing which his right. drawing was a rooster all right i thought it would be appropriate to start with a rooster since the rooster starts the day on a farm or at least that's the cliche i'm sure a lot of farmers get up before the rooster crows so my materials here were color pencil, and I was actually using some Prismacolor sticks at the time, which are apparently um, no longer in production, um, but I also used um, uh, some pencils in there, and the drawing could have been created with uh, colored pencil um, just the same and not, the, and not in stick form. So it's colored pencil on black paper, and um, I tried to use the black or leave the black showing a lot um, in the texture in the ground and also in the rooster. You know, I chose a rooster that had a, a lot of darkness anyway. Wanting to use that black that kind of peeped through all of my marks to unify the artwork a little bit. Um, so anyway, I was uh, pretty pleased with the mark making, you know, the sort of the scribble texture of the ground. I thought that was pretty effective. Um, I like the brightness of the colors that I was able to achieve on that dark surface still. I remember during the broadcast, the feed looked a little darker than my artwork did in person. And so the representation on screen tonight is a little bit closer to, um, to the way the original 
um, looks. So uh, maybe that'll be, if you happen to go back and see this video, if you want to follow along with rooster drawing um, because you had missed that one, just know that the feed might be a little bit darker than what you're seeing here. So pump up those colors. Um, let's see. I do like the disconnected quality of the marks, especially in the tail. There's a, quite a few um, feathery type marks that really have a, have a beginning and ending um, that is identifiable. You know, they're supposed to just sort of disappear into the dark shadows of that tail. What I would have done a little bit different, I think, is also in the tail. Some of those black areas in my original reference weren't completely black. They were just really dark. And so were I to do it again, I think I would have probably, before I started putting in those bold marks in the tail, I might have put just a, a little bit of value that was slightly lighter than black um, and then worked those marks, those, uh, those bolder, brighter marks uh, that sort of stand alone over top of them. And I feel like they might have, uh, um, they just might have harmonized a little bit more and felt actually um, a little less individual, a little less separate from one another. So I believe in hindsight, the next time I work on all black paper, I'm going to consider, is there any area that I want to make sort of a foggy dark gray um, before I actually start mark making? Hmm. Well, I like the contrast uh, that happens there when, you, when you're using those bright colors mm -hmm. on black paper. And, you know, the art sticks may be discontinued, but you could get the same effect using new pastels, sure. which would be pretty similar. And yeah. you mentioned colored pencils. Um, the, the mark making quality though of the art sticks is very similar to the pastels. You yeah. get those thicker marks. Um, I love the energy in the grass. And I think I mentioned that mm -hmm. when you were doing it. Another thing that I really like about this drawing that I think is really essential that, uh, I think we often kind of caution people on is this edge right here. And it's kind of hard to see that cause I'm using red to outline this, but this edge right here where there's a, there's the blackness of the paper that's left mm -hmm. uh, before the color begins. And it kind of acts a little bit as an outline, but you need that outline right there. Uh, you need an edge right there, a dark edge, to separate those colors from the grass colors. You yeah, know, you, especially in the top half of the rooster, you know, that course, sort of red orange right. and the grass are close to the same value. You know, they're very different in color, but they're still close to the same value. So I like to think of those as like dark accents more than outlines, you know, partial outlines, I think are effective sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I'm just using the word outline for mm -hmm. lack of a better term, but it still has a little it, bit it, of line quality it does. in there, yeah, it even does. though it's, it's left open. I tried it still to maintain reads that little line. gap. Yeah. I and, agree. um, you know, it's interesting because it's a line left by the color of the paper. It's not an actual mark that was made on the surface. Uh, yeah, I really like this drawing. I think you did a fantastic job with it. It's, What's interesting is when you use pastels, this part of you comes out. What do you mean? Like this style. Oh, okay. oh yeah, emerges. right. Or the black paper and right, pastel. Right, the black yeah. paper pastel yeah. kind of combination. I, I use those uh, those type of media, um, I think, differently than, than uh, my process you with do. other drawing You do, material. and it's interesting yeah. to watch that take shape, and it's really cool. Um, well, um, I do a lot of, I have in the past done a lot of painting on a black surface and looked at Diego Velasquez's artwork. Uh -huh. I'm spending some time looking at the broke artist's work because they did work on dark surfaces. And you will find these stray brushstrokes that just appear to disappear into the darkness. And so mm -hmm. I think my inspiration for how I work on a dark surface are those Baroque paintings from the, like the 1600s. Interesting. <laughs> All right. Very cool. All right. Well, we've got our first drawings down. We 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 pretty we did pretty well with that. I you think know, so. I, we're trying to move at it. We're I, trying to. We don't want to go too slow or too fast. <laughs> right. We still got to get all ten of them. We're in. trying to move at a good pace because the last time we did this, uh, we were <coughs> running out of time, and we have another broadcast after yeah. this. Um, now, I did a little bit of research. Of course, I pulled out the pencils, and <laughs> they're actually um, Stiegler pencils. They are uh, Mars Lumograph black pencils uh, that I used. I kept one to say Faber Castell, but uh, they are by Stiegler. And I would bet the Faber Castell uh, shineless graphite pencils that everybody's talking about, or the shineless pencils, I bet they're pretty similar. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't used them, but I would venture to guess that they are similar. And the paper that I used is Strathmore toned gray paper, uh, not Artigan paper, uh, although I have some Artigan paper in here. For whatever reason, I get those paper names confused every once in a while. Uh, all right, moving on now. Uh, my second drawing was the nose, and noses are tricky. 
Uh, but if you remember a few things when drawing a nose, it's a lot easier. We talked about drawing a nose with four lines, one, two, three, four, and then the rest is developing the value. And those lines kind of melt anyway when mm -hmm. you start developing the drawing. Uh, for this particular drawing, I like the softness of the drawing. Uh, I think I remember in my mind uh, going very quickly with this and getting a lot done and then all of a sudden running out of time. I think, <laughs> I think that's kind of how I felt in this drawing, that it, was going to, it wasn't going to take the full 45 minutes, but it ended up pushing me at the end to take the 45 minutes. And that's because when you have a subject that has a lot of gradations and value, you really have to concentrate on those gradations and value and those relationships of value in order to, to uh, you know, create the illusion of a three-dimensional form in space. And uh, that brings me to my biggest criticism here is that I really feel like I could have made the nose protrude a little bit more uh, on the surface. And I'm critiquing this by not looking at the photo, just looking at the drawing, which is how a, a drawing should be critiqued. True. Um, and I feel pretty confident that I was kind of going off of the photo reference and relying on it maybe a little bit too much. But I could have made the nose feel like it stands out a little bit more by making some of the shadows uh, where it recedes a little bit darker and maybe have this transition have a little bit more of a middle value in this area and a little bit more of a middle value here. This area is pretty light, uh, but if mm -hmm. we have a middle value here, a middle value here, and a darker value over here, it's gonna make the nose feel like it protrudes a little bit more. I don't really think that uh, we're lacking too much on the bottom, although I could make the values here a little bit darker, um, and that, would, again, would kind of accentuate the receding part of the bottom part of the nose. Uh, but, uh, again, that's being critical. Uh, again, I feel like I, I, I'm happy with the way that I handled the skin texture. And uh, in some of these areas, it's kind of reading like the imperfections that we would see on skin. Yeah, right there and freckles. below the nostrils, particularly on the left side, you've yeah, got right sort of there. that bumpy or warbly skin texture. Um, that media on the gray paper, I guess, going back and forth between light and dark with mm -hmm. the stump. Um, lends itself to that, I guess. Mm -hmm. Maybe you did a lot of that with a work with a stump. Yeah. I really like what you did in the nostrils and the highlight around the nostril on our right. You know, there's where you see a lot of those value changes really fast. Um, in the left nostril from almost black to some white speckles, you know, just mm -hmm. a few just a few millimeters away. So there's a lot of value changes in there, some hard edges, some soft edges. So that's why it took so long. There's a lot of subtlety. Yeah. There's a lot of subtlety <laughs> in the bottom part of that nose, even though a nose seems like there's so much less going on than in, yeah. an, in an eye or um, or an ear or something like that. Right. So again, only four lines, but then those values are where where your time goes, of yeah. course. And again, like any other drawing, this could be you know, manipulated further. You can continue to, to uh, manipulate the material on the surface until you get it just right. Uh, but again, uh, I, I was pretty pleased with the nose. I, I do feel like it reads as a nose, obviously. Um, I do, and I feel like it projects. <laughs> it you know, does project. Out, definitely coming out at us. It could probably pop out a little bit more, but it, you know, I, and when we're going through this critique, I, I think it's important for you guys to understand that when you see things about your art that you don't like, um, you should embrace that to a certain degree. I know it's frustrating to see things that you would like to change in a drawing or painting and um, feel like you can't change them because maybe you're afraid you're gonna do something to the artwork, but it's good to be critical of your own artworks. And if you look at a piece of art that you've created and you can't find anything that you would change or do differently, um, then it's probably, it's, you need to be a little bit more introspective. Yeah, look artist. at it tomorrow. You'll find something <laughs> right. wrong with it tomorrow. Uh, because <laughs> we find imperfections and things that we can change about every artwork that we, it's, you know, that it's we imperfections create. that keep us making marks, you right, know, you, you, right? You get it all blocked in and then you just start looking for the imperfections, look for things you can, cor you know, correct for lack of a better term or adjust. So that's right. really the process is looking for something that looks wrong. And then just kind of trying to work it out um, through some, you know, experience and trial and error. And this um, self-critiquing is the experience part. You don't have to go back and make changes in a drawing if you find something you're not happy with. Just make a mental note so the next time you have an opportunity, you take advantage of, of what you noticed in a previous drawing. Right. And what's interesting is while I'm critiquing the nose, I'm looking at it on this screen in Photoshop. And then I'm looking at it on that screen um, 
which is a different screen, and the values look better on the oh. second screen. Uh, you know, so it looks like it's protruding a little bit more than it does in Photoshop. So, okay. All right, uh, moving on to Ashley's next drawing, tractor. All right, this is my tractor. Um, I figured after the rooster crows, the next thing to do is climb on that tractor maybe and, uh, and plow the field, or at least, you know, that's sort of the beginning <laughs> of the farming season is plow. Originally, I thought I'll, I'll use the farming theme, and then I'll try to move like through time, like the beginning of the day with the rooster working my way through time, but that kind of fell you apart. You really felt that? I really thought that. <laughs> But I couldn't think, what do you do at 10 o'clock on a farm? What do you do at who, 2 o'clock on a farm? How would you know what I you do I don't know. So I just farm. picked random farming objects after that. But that was my original intention. So anyway, <laughs> um, I really like drawing with a ballpoint pen. That was the, the media here, partly because it's a little bit um, unconventional. Um, I like to draw with materials or um, sculpt with materials sometimes that are... Um, that you don't find in art stores just to show that art can be made with anything it really happens you know it's a mindset making art is a mindset the materials don't really do it for us um, even though we may have some of our favorites and my favorites are really low tech materials like the ballpoint pen and I'm um, getting into high tech materials too like um, like Photoshop and Procreate pretty opposites so I did this one in blue, um, with, instead of a black pen, I thought that would be um, kind of nice. It's really a German tractor, but it kind of reminds me of an old Ford tractor, being that it's in blue. So it has a little bit of, a, of nostalgia for me, because I grew up not on a farm, but around farms in a small community, and I would see those old Ford tractors all the time, um, I guess they were more popular in my area. All right, again, I, I like the mark making. I like the vertical marks um, that I used on the body of the tractor, and they bend a little bit around the highlight on the top. So I did, where, where there were smoother areas, I tried to use marks that sort of followed the direction that the plane was traveling. Yeah, um, you there, can see that here. Yeah, right. There's a lot of busyness, like where the motor out. was or the tires themselves, a lot of cross hatching in there. Yeah. But at least where the surfaces were flatter or smoother, I tried to use more hatching instead of cross hatching just to describe the, the the surface of the form a little bit better. Um, again, I like the mood that the blue tractor created probably versus a black. And uh, also, it's a three-quarter view, so mm -hmm. that's pretty... Um, that can be pleasing because it creates a little bit of space mm -hmm. even in a, an environment-less image like this. There was really no picture plane. You know, it's in a rectangle right now because it is on a, on a computer screen, um, but I didn't have a picture plane I was working inside of. It was just sort of a sketch out in the middle of a page, and there was really no environment. In fact, I think we may have just made up the shadow on the ground at the end just to make it feel like it's in a space, that it has a ground plane. But the three-quarter view keeps it from feeling too flat. Um, if we would had if we had drawn it in profile, it might have felt just a little bit flat. So um, I do like that the angle that I had drawn it in. Now, it was a harder to draw than I thought it would be in 45 minutes. Um, you know, I did a lot of uh, scribbling of little dark shapes in the motor area to try to make it look sort of complicated. There's a lot of details that we did leave out. I don't think that reads. You know, it looks complex enough to be believable. Um, but I, but I did feel like I was uh, running out of of, a, of time here. Um, I would have wanted to probably, in hindsight, I would I, I wish I would have probably put a little bit more value in places in the background, um, just to bring our attention back onto the tractor. Maybe on maybe in the background on the right side because the tractor has lighter values on the right side in the right side of the drawing, versus the left where the tire and the, and the seat um, provide a little bit more contrast. So. I kind of wish I'd had a chance to do just some, some nondescript, non-objective shading around in the background on the right. Maybe just kind of bleed that out a little bit um, towards the left. So that's something I would have, would probably done different mm, in this one. I think there's some places that I know I should have been darker. You know, if we look at the value on the front tires, um, they are much darker and are at least uh, noticeably darker than the darker values in the rear tire and under the seat. You know, those should be some really dark areas. So I feel like I could have gone back there and pumped up the volume a little bit. Well, that's that's a problem with using, you know, like a, a monotone 
material like pen and ink yeah. or not, pen, not, not, not like pen and ink like ink. ballpoint pen like a, yeah. ball, a blue ballpoint pen mm -hmm. uh, because the darkest value you can achieve is as dark as the is solid the blue. blue right you so get. you've already limited your range a little bit right that's true but even though that challenge is present there I still think this is very impressive and um, I, I think I think we're comfortable with ballpoint pens because we write with them all the time yes. so it feels like a medium that we are uh, you know a little bit more familiar with obviously mm -hmm. so um, I think being comfortable with your drawing medium or painting medium is important I think confidence with that medium is important I think you can put you in a mindset right of that where you're where you can make art where you're not worried or scared or nervous and we're a little nervous anyway when we make these drawings so um, it's helpful when it's not about the media that we're nervous about just about you guys watching us yeah, and I think that's true for you guys, too. I think probably a lot of you feel more comfortable picking up a ballpoint pen uh, rather than, I don't know, a, a, a dip pen uh, to, to mm -hmm. make a pen and ink drawing. So uh, that if we use dip pens every day um, as part of our everyday life, uh, then maybe more of us would be comfortable with that. But Right. If it was 1750, we'd all love drawing with dip pens because right. we'd have learned to write with dip pens. So <laughs> It might have been a feather then. Yeah. Um, but anyway, I really like this drawing. Um, and I like the three-dimensional view of it, and I, I think all the proportions are correct. And I think that this this subject is uh, would, is a difficult subject to tackle with a um, such a permanent medium like ink. So, well, um, Buddy points out that it was ballpoint pen with graphite, and that is true. Right, I right, did that's start true. I did start with a pencil, and there was a little bit of discussion along the way as to whether I should erase the pencil or not. And maybe you can find the pencil in there. I'm having a hard time seeing it, but I did not erase the pencil. I just went right over it. Well, I th I think once the when uh, I think the pencil marks are actually reading as darker values in yeah. a lot of the I areas. I think there's pencil in the steering wheel. If I had to say where yeah. it was more visible, I'm was... looking at it uh, a little bit closer than you are because okay. it's right in front of my face, and <laughs> huh. uh, you can see the graphite marks. And that's one thing I would be curious to see what this drawing would look like if it was all blue. Uh, yeah. with the graphite removed um, if if it would read even better than it does now. Mm -hmm. It may. Uh, so. um, you know, ballpoint pen's not as permanent as actual drawing ink. So I would, if I were to go back and erase it, I think it would be a job for the kneaded eraser, something that's pretty soft, not too abrasive, um, just so you don't smear your ballpoint pen. So be careful with that. Ballpoint pen can smear, maybe if you use one of those white vinyl erasers over the top of it. Um, and just real quickly, there's some discussion on the email I sent out about the live lesson series that we're getting ready to start. It is a jellyfish. Um, and when someone said that, the email said octopus, I started freaking out for a second. And then someone <laughs> confirmed that it is a jellyfish. I did put that in the email. So <laughs> thank goodness Woo. for that. Um, and I know I didn't call everybody from where they're from tonight. And that's because I am focusing a little bit more on the screen in front of me. But I am going back to your comments. And if we have a little bit of time at the end, I'll scroll through and make sure that uh, we get as many of these of, of your comments as possible yeah. here. Um, and also in the comment section, if you're watching this after the live broadcast, if you're watching this sometime in the future, let us know your thoughts in the comments below this video too, because um, I'll read them and uh, I'm, that's going to be helpful for us as well. So as, and someone else also freaked out, this is the season finale of this season already. Well, this is actually the 11th episode in this season. Um, it it so has gone, gone by fast. It really does. It has gone by fast, but this is the 11th uh, episode. So we'll just take a few weeks off. Everybody freaks out after the end of each season. We're going to come back. We're going to do more Getting Sketchy. Uh, it's it's very popular. You guys love it. So mm -hmm. we're not going to stop doing it. We're just yeah. going to take a little bit of a break. Um, all right, let's get back into uh, the next drawing, which was... Was it your mouth? The mouth? Not my mouth. Yeah. But mouth. a mouth. Yeah. Um, I love this one. It's one of my favorites of yours. Well, this thanks, season. Because I mean, this is my least favorite. Really? How about yeah. that? Gosh. Um, I just, now with the mouth, I, all of my formats for these drawings are, are really, really small. Like yeah. three inches by two and a half inches. I made the format very small on purpose because all the facial features are fairly complex. And I wanted to make sure that I was able to get the drawing in done in 45 minutes or close to it. Uh, the mouth, again, just like the nose, is all about value and the and the transitions of value. This one especially, the light source was coming from the right side and is also um, somewhat of a 
a softer light. And whenever we have a softer light, we have those really long, smooth gradations of, of value. And uh, the opposite of that is true when we have harsh light. If we have mm -hmm. a really strong light, we have a, a really strong highlight and a really strong defined shadow. And sometimes when we draw things or paint things in harsh light, it's a little bit easier to uh, find those highlights and shadows. But in soft light, those gradations occur so slowly. It's kind of like when you throw a frog in cold water and you slowly turn up the heat and the frog boils. <laughs> it doesn't <laughs> jump out of the water. I've never done this. I've heard that. I've heard that's what a frog does. <laughs> <laughs> that it's kind of a slow heat and they don't jump out of the, the oh, thing. Gosh. But if you throw a frog in boiling water, they'll jump out. Hmm. Um, so it's, I guess it's not the same thing, but I think you understand <laughs> what I'm saying. I'm going to do an those experiment. Those slow gradations can happen so gradually that when you're moving across them with your eye and you're watching for those value changes, oh. because there's not strong contrast between those values, it can be really tricky to pay attention to the actual value that you're seeing. To the change. Right. The rate of change. Right. And what the actual value is, because you might have a slightly lighter value that's just a couple inches away from a slightly darker value. And that can make a big difference in communicating the form of the subject. Um, and this was one of those subjects that had those very subtle transitions in, in value, mm -hmm. which in my mind made it uh, a little bit more challenging than the others. And then also all the texture in the lips as well, it's very important to capture that. Yeah, I think that's what attracts me to it, is the, oh, you, you like the, the texture, texture in the lips. lips. I think it's really effective. Um, and again, since, since the drawing is small, you can really see the texture of the paper. Um, so obviously my least favorite drawing that I did this season, uh, but the, the wonderful thing about art, or one of the wonderful things about art, is Ashley said it was the, his favorite drawing I did this season. Or one of them, yeah. Or one of them, and it's my least favorite drawing that I've done this season. So when you're creating your own pieces of art and you come across a piece or you make a piece that you're, is not your favorite, don't throw it away. Don't, I mean, you could hide it away, but don't throw it away <laughs> because everything that you do has merit and, and has a little bit of importance, even if you don't feel like it has importance. There are, are drawings and paintings that I've done that I, I said to myself, no one will ever see this, I'm putting it away. And I've gone back later and looked at them. It's like, you know, this was this was okay. This was pretty good. Uh, I don't know why I quit on this. I don't know why I stopped on this. I don't know why I'm hiding this one away. Uh, so um, it, maybe from this piece, we can take that away. Um, just a few things I want to point out here mm -hmm. as we're kind of reviewing things. Um, a mouth, just like a nose, and just like, well, obviously like eyes, uh, are, are not always symmetrical. Um, in fact, most of the time, they're not symmetrical. So when you are drawing mouths, don't feel like this side of the mouth needs to look like the other side of the mouth. It doesn't have to be perfectly symmetrical. In fact, it shouldn't be because most of us aren't symmetrical. And in, in fact, I think it was an artist mm -hmm. that did uh, photos and they yeah. used Photoshop and they took half of the face and just flipped it on the other side. We used to do that. And the in, result uh, is very odd looking. Yeah. You, people look like aliens when you do that. And the whole point is we are not symmetrical. Uh, we are asymmetrical, and that's part of the beauty of human beings is that we are asymmetrical, and it's not perfectly the same on each Approximate side. symmetry. Approximate, that's it's approximately That's what we the got same, going on, approximate but not symmetry. not exactly the same. The key takeaways from the mouth, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time critiquing the composition in this piece uh, because, uh, again, it's just a mouth. Um, but the key takeaways for the mouth is typically our light source is going to be coming from above. This is going to produce a darker value on the upper lip. And then we typically see that the bottom lip is lighter in value. And then there's a darker area right underneath it. So often people will try to draw mouths and they'll draw the out par outside part of the mouth first. And then they run into problems when they try to go onto the inside part because it's harder to gauge the distance from here to here than it is to judge the distance from here to here and hmm. then the distance from here to here. So what I like to do is I like to start with the line in the middle, then it's easier for me to gauge the top edge and the bottom edge. Work away from the center. Right, so I basically like start in the middle and work your way out. And in, in, in a closed mouth like this where the lips come together, that's really your hardest edge. You know, it's the one mm -hmm. you can initially find with a line and everything else becomes shading almost. Pretty hard edge at the bottom of the lip, too. Yeah, right here. Or bottom of the bottom lip, yeah. Um, another thing that I did not mention when I drew the mouth, and I'm not really sure why I didn't, 
But when we drew the eye, I talked about the eyelashes and the check marks going down and up. The mouth is the same way. If we divided the mouth into sections, in this section we would see lines or contrast in value that goes down and then up like this, very reminiscent of the eye. And on this side, down and up like this, and mm -hmm. on the bottom lip, just like that. And you can see that these are flowing with the cross contours of the form of the lip. Uh, so maybe not a proper critique, but at least a couple of tips on drawing a mouth yeah. that I neglected to share with you guys when we did this live. So, um, all right, I, I guess we're ready to move on to the next one. I think we're doing great here with Tom. Yeah, I think right, so. The next one was Ashley's <coughs> sheep. Excuse me. All right, so um, I was uh, pretty pleased with my sheep. Um, he's got a he's got a sly little grin, and his uh, his long eyelashes cover part of his eye, so I felt like it gave him a little bit of an expression. Um, I think for the sheep, I feel like what I tried to do was plot using the edges of the picture plane about where um, that ear was. I feel like I moved the ear around a little bit, the one that's in sort of sort of forward, sort of coming out towards us. And then, uh, and then sort of arrange the face um, around that ear. Um, use the same type of scribble stroke or scribble mark as I did in the grass of the rooster, just tighter, you know. And I felt like the that was really effective. I'm really pleased. I feel like that at least the wool um, has that sort of um, cloud-like billowy wool feel. So I thought that the texture in those uh, in the in the sheep worked pretty well. Um, I used straight lines in the background. Of course, this is, I'm sorry, I didn't start with the media. This was all graphite, just a regular pencil. Um, probably, I was probably using a black wing pencil or a general's layout pencil. Both of those will be darker than an HB or a number two pencil. So because of all those, um, the scribbly marks in the wool, and also because all the sheep's very rounded, you know, the ears are sort of round, the nose is round, really soft shapes. Um, I decided a sh soft contours. So I wanted to use straighter lines in the background to create some contrast, both in terms of value and in the line type. So I just use horizontal lines in the background. Sometimes sort of briskly made horizontal lines can feel like movement or motion or motion blur, something like that. And um, so it makes the sheep feel really still. Um, with those types of lines in the background. So overall, I was pretty happy with this. Um, background's a little bit patchy um, intentionally. I do like that, but um, now that I'm looking at it, um, you know, with some space between when I drew it, I think I would have liked to bring the background down another value step on the value scale. You know, the lighter patches make those match the darker patches and bring the darks um, down further still. And there's a little bit of contrast lost right at the top of the head of the sheep compared to like the face and that little bit of uh, light that kind of goes down the back of the neck. So contrast is good there, but I think it could have used maybe more of those up darker patches in the background. Um, I think that's about it. I don't have a lot for this critique. It, there's not a lot, I would say there's not a lot of white space left. Um, so I'm also I'm pretty happy with that for being a, a light colored animal. You know, it's like a white sheep. It's nice to to note that there's just a tiny bit of raw paper left over. Well, uh, what's interesting about, well, first of all, this is one of my favorite drawings that you did. Okay, great. Um, I, and I, I think the fur is just fantastic. Mm -hmm. I really, really like the fur. I like the selective uh, contouring that you did. Oh yeah, there, are, um, there is a little around bit the of edges. that. Yeah. That made it contrast and, or, or stand out a little bit more because of the contrast. Um, but you said that you wanted to maybe think about making the background a little bit lighter. Or darker. Darker. Mm -hmm. Definitely darker. I yeah. thought you said lighter. Oh, no, no. I if I did, I didn't mean to. Definitely darker. So let's yeah. see what happens if we do that. I went ahead and isolated it a All little right. bit. Um, so we're just going to bring the brightness down a little bit on the background and see if Ooh, that look makes at that. the sheep stand out a little Go bit. Go back more. up. A, not quite as dark. Yeah, right about there. I like that. I think that works better. Go. Yeah, it definitely does. I think it, those values are are closer to the darkest values in the sheep wool, mm -hmm. and it brings the value of the sheep out. Right. That, that's the thought I had when I yeah. was looking at it. I do like you know you're getting contrast with the line with the the linear qualities, the lines that you're making, mm -hmm. uh, because the lines on the sheep are a little bit more squiggly ish, yeah. and the lines in the background are horizontal, obviously. Um, but that additional contrast with a darker value really makes that sheep. 
uh, pop. Look how effective Photoshop is at helping us make decisions sometimes. What you just oh, did yeah. is what I do sometimes when I've got a big decision to make and mm -hmm. I'm not sure if I, if I, if it's going to work or not. Mm -hmm. I'll throw a traditional drawing just like Matt's done into Photoshop and make a change and see if it works for me before I take that step in my traditional art. And I experiment with background colors, too. Uh, in fact, Live Lesson Series not too long ago, well, it's probably a long time ago, we painted a bird with acrylics. Mm -hmm. And uh, I decided to change the background, but I wasn't sure what background color I was going to use. So I experimented yeah. with different colors in Photoshop. So. Yeah. All right, let's back this back out and bring it back to its original uh, shape there. <laughs> still, <laughs> still great that way. Yeah. Um, all right. And then my next one was the ear. Um, so pretty straightforward here. Mm -hmm. A the lot of ear. pretty bright, um, <laughs> or intense light on this one too. You had a lot of contrast in this one. Yeah. And I think, um, I think I, I, I was really pleased with this drawing. I, the, the, this one was a little bit larger, uh, format, um, than the other ones. And mm -hmm. you can really see the difference. If I go back to the mouth, uh, you can really see the texture of the paper yeah, because, because it was, Smaller. The photo is, is we're like zoom, enlarged. We're in more. Yeah, I, I don't know, three or four times at least. Um, where this one is a little bit further back, uh, I felt obviously a little bit more confident drawing the ear um, in the forty-five minutes over the mouth. And uh, is it because the there's eye. less texture? Because there's no texture? No, okay. I'm, I like texture. I uh, yeah. I've, I know you have a thing with texture. Yeah, I have a love-hate relationship <laughs> with texture. But I like texture because I feel like texture is a weapon. I feel yeah. like texture, maybe a weapon is the wrong term, yeah. but a tool that uh, it's your we secret can use. weapon. Yeah, you can it's, pull it out when you need to, or leave it out when you want to. Right. If yeah. you want to, if you want to make a drawing or painting more interesting, just add some texture. Mm, that's it's like true. spice. It's right, like, it is like spice. Draw attention to an area, just right. put a pattern or a texture there. Um, and this does have a texture. It's a smoother texture. Right, it's true. Smooth, um, smooth counts as a yeah. texture. But this is another one of those drawings where it's really about the value relationships and the gradations of those values, and there's not a lot of hard lines. Uh, we obviously started out with lines, and if you missed this broadcast, um, then you need to go back and watch it as we totally butcher the anatomical... Uh, terms for the ear in in that broadcast. Uh, we were trying our best to locate all of the or or refer to the parts of the ear uh, scientifically correct. I can't remember and, any of those. <laughs> I can't remember. We, we used those uh, uh, proper terms for a whole hour and none of it stuck. <laughs> no, I, can't, I can't remember any of them. Um, I don't think lobe was one of them. Lobe is what we call it. anyway. Um, Lobule. I, yes, I, I feel like with this drawing, I took. A little, and I'm going to talk more in, in terms of technical use of the material because, again, I can't really uh, comment on the composition. It's an ear. Um, but I feel like in this drawing, I, I, I was making a little bit more of a lighter touch with the material. Mm -hmm. I think I worked a little bit slower and a little bit more deliberately in this drawing because I felt more confident and I felt like I had more time. And also since the bulk of the drawing was very similar to the tone of the paper. Mm. I didn't have to do a lot of work to make the values super dark or super light. I could just slowly adjust them and I could pull an ear out of the paper, uh, if, all, if that makes sense. Um, and because I worked slow, slower and uh, with a little bit more confidence, I think the end result was a little bit stronger uh, than the mouth, for example, in my opinion. Uh, but I was pretty happy with this ear. And again, I just wanna point out that uh, while I may have shared some tips when we did these drawings on how to kind of uh, manufacture these facial features using a, a kind of a step-by-step -step process, there really is no um, pathway to draw every ear no or formula. to draw every, no formula. Yeah. Um, there are things that you can think about in your mind in kind of an order of steps, an order of observation that you can go through when you draw uh, people's facial features, but I don't want you guys to get too reliant on formulas that you may pick up here or there, uh, because every ear is dramatically different. Uh, if you don't believe me, just... Even then, even the same ear is different under different lighting circumstances. Right, absolutely. It's always a unique experience. Um, tomorrow, or sometime when you're out in public and you have an opportunity to look at other people's ears, <laughs> just make it a point to go walk around and look at everybody's ear and see how drastically different everyone's ears are. It's kind of shocking, because 
you know, we all kind of assume that an ear is an ear. We look at this, this drawing, yeah, that's an ear. And I could draw a completely different ear from somebody else's head and it would look completely different and you would still be able to say it's an ear. Mm -hmm. uh, but those are the little subtle things that are so important for capturing the likeness of a person in your drawing. Um, it's just those little subtle differences. And if you get too attached to a formula, then you're gonna lose out on the likeness of the person and all your drawings are gonna look the same. I'm sure you guys have seen people who are really tied to the Loomis method and every drawing they do, they are just following the Loomis method to a T. And the Loomis method is great. It's fantastic. It's a great approach to drawing heads and, and people's faces. Um, but if you get too attached to a formula, then all of your people end up looking like a Loomis head, for example. You know, uh, Raphael kind of had a, a head that he made up that is sometimes referred to as Raphael-esque. Oh, really? And you can tell when he was doing it because it's like a perfect upside-down egg shape that he used for their heads, you know, and it was yeah. a lot like the initial shape sometimes you make in the Loomis method. So you can find that in, uh, in uh, Raphael's artwork if you look hard enough. Well, um, speaking of Renaissance um, artwork, this does to me look really, really sculptural. You know, I don't know if it's the, the, the color you know, the grays that are in there yeah. or the soft changes in values, but it, it almost feels sculptural like it's made of marble to me. Okay. Um, well, thanks. I think that's mm -hmm. a compliment. Because, yeah, definitely. Um, I'm pretty sure there's a, uh, you know, one of the classical ways of learning how to draw is drawing from casts. That's right. Yeah, that's so, right. Um, I think uh, that feel? That's many great. Renaissance artists would spend a year copying drawings, and then they would spend the next year copying casts, and then they would start working on artwork that was, uh, you know, intended to be sold. All right, uh, moving on to the horse now. Oh, yeah. All right, let's see. So this was my um, second drawing in the season on black paper. Yeah, I like, you know, like Matt, I like toned paper, gray and black, because the paper does some of the work for us. Um, if we leave too much of the paper white, when we draw on white paper, our artwork can feel unfinished. But when we leave pretty broad areas black or gray on gray and black paper, um, sometimes the gray and black paper feels like it's supposed to be there. It feels intentional, um, not, uh, not empty, even if we really haven't touched it. And quite a bit of the shadow on this horse is, is untouched. It's just the raw paper showing through. So this was white charcoal on black. I believe I was using... I think I was using the smooth side of Canson Mitant's paper for this. I don't think it was was charcoal paper. I don't see the texture of the charcoal paper in there. So again, similar to my tractor, um, the horse is in a three-quarter view, and it has a strong light source from one side, which is a lot of what attracted me to this horse. Uh, Matt mentioned before when the light's strong, um, where the lights and the darks come together are a little easier to find and identify. And they, they really are on this horse where the front of the face meets the side of the face. But there's some pretty subtle stuff happening on the front of the face of the horse. I don't know what that's called. And, um, and I, I had to, area. yeah, that area, that's right. And I, I was pretty careful in there. Yeah. I spent a good bit of time in there because I wanted the bone structure to, to come through. I felt like that's the defining uh, feature or characteristic of the horse. Um, what uh, what I did in the background was almost entirely with a stump, and I loved that. And I had a pretty dir dirty stump. You know, it was uh, loaded with white material from smearing a little bit. And I'd also um, gone ahead and put that bright white of a, I guess it's a fence maybe, um, that's right underneath the horse. And uh, I'd already put that in. And so I almost used that whiter area as a palette to load my stump. And then I felt like I was painting um, with a stump in the background. And mm -hmm. so it's got a real soft feel compared to the foreground that was made not with a, with a stump, which is soft, but with the tip of the charcoal pencil, which is pretty hard. So I thought that was a good way to separate um, the background and the foreground. You know, the media is the same, some of the values match, but the application was a little bit different. Um, let's see. Mm, there is a little bit of a shadow on the fence that is right underneath the horse it's a little curve and um i, I was on the, i was on the fence you're on the fence about it. even including that <laughs> in there and when i look at it now i'm not sure if it if it seems like a shadow at all i know that's what it was because i saw it in the original photograph mm -hmm. but I, in hindsight i think i would either just get rid of that or make it more prominent have that shadow come yeah. down a little further um and and be a little bit more the shape um or uh, echo the shape of the muzzle um, and then I think it might read more as a shadow. So that's a little bit of 
little quirkiness down there in the top of the fence. It, it has nothing to do with the horse, um, but it, it bothered me a little bit when I was making the piece, and it's still bothering me now. Yeah, I agree with that. I feel like um, it feels, it almost makes the the snout of the horse, if that's the term. We're just making up words here. Yeah, I said muzzle. Yeah. You said snout, but you guys know what we mean. Yeah. It almost feels like that is behind the fence, and the shadow is is like a imperfection in the fence yeah. right now. Okay. To me. You know like it's mean? part of the horse back there. It's part of the, maybe there's a piece of wood or something Missing. on that fence that's discolored. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and so it's not, Excuse me. it doesn't bother, it didn't bother me when I looked at it. But okay. now that well, you've pointed it, it out. If it reads like something that's believable to you, then Yeah, it that, seems we'll natural. And I honestly feel like, uh, you know, talking about the fence down here, there could be a little bit more variety in the value, you know? Yeah. Um, and that little bit of variety right there doesn't really stand out as being strange to me. Okay. But now that you mentioned it's a shadow and you have... Um, such a strong light source coming from this direction. You've got yeah. this area of shadow right over here. It all, it feels like the shadow for the horse should be cast at an angle, you know? It does. It does. Um, and that's another reason why it feels like that doesn't it, read It's as not a shadow, a shadow yeah, right? So it's just, I mean, it's, it's, it's nitpicky. It's not about the yeah, horse. It's, it's not anywhere near the focal <laughs> point. You know, it's not really what we're, I want people to look at, but it's what, it's what I keep looking at when I see this piece because it's just, mm -hmm. You know, just uh, stuck in my mind is a little bit problematic. Yeah. Well, I, it's this is a fantastic composition. It's laid out nicely. And the smokiness you're getting from the blending stumps is really nice. Mm -hmm. uh, it gives it a sense of atmosphere. I really like uh, this uh, area right here, which was just kind of smudgy. It's like the last 30 seconds. Yeah, but it kind of makes that area. the main feel like it's a little bit out of focus maybe. Mm -hmm. And it brings a little bit more focus to this area. Um, yeah, a lot of people are saying that they are blown away by this drawing. Not, not surprised by that at all. Well, I got to tell you, I've been looking for it for the last two weeks. I can't find this drawing anywhere. It's, some, it's, it's somewhere in my house, it's and it's driving me crazy because I really like this drawing, and it is not the one that I wanted to lose. I'm yeah. sure it's safe between two, like, white pieces of paper folded up um, so that yeah, it wouldn't somewhere. smear, and then I've stuck it in something. You didn't bring it to school, did you? No, no. Um, it's in my house somewhere. Well... Uh, if you've never drawn with white material and black paper, I know it can seem a little bit scary because you're drawing the highlights and leaving the shadows, but I would encourage you to do it because you can get a lot of information communicated in a short period of time when you work on black paper. I think Ashley mentioned this when he started talking about uh, the horse. Uh, when you work on white paper, you don't have that luxury. You've got to put a lot of material on the surface to really get a range of value with black paper. But there are a lot of circumstances where subjects are in harsh or strong light mm -hmm. or very little light where the light that is present is intense. And that is a perfect combination for uh, working on black paper with a white material when you yeah. have that high contrast. So uh, beautiful job. All right. Uh, moving on now to my last drawing. All right. And Putting this, it all together. This is the one. <laughs> Well, this guy was staring me down. Man, he is in, he, he has is an intense staring me down. Stare. He looks yep. like he's he's uh, hypnotized me or something. I don't know. Um, anyway, this is the one I dreaded all season because the whole season I was wondering how in the world am I going to draw a whole portrait in forty five minutes? <laughs> um, obviously, I had to make the format a little bit bigger to fit the face in the the space, but it still was relatively small, um, and I had to draw super quick for this one. So it is looser, it is sketchier than the other drawings, and I wasn't able to spend a lot of time doing blending like I could with the ear, for example, where mm -hmm. I had really soft transitions of value because of the time constraint. What I was helped by in this drawing is that it is high contrast. It already had a very strong, defined light source coming from the right, but also a secondary light source coming from the left, which is lighting up the left side of the face. And that created an area of shadow right along here, very strong shadow on this side of the face. Um, so that actually helped communicate the form of the subject because yeah, of he that feels strong contrast. Almost, he feels very blocky, you know? It's yeah. such a sharp shadow, he almost feels like a cube. Right, so <laughs> with a portrait that would have had a little bit more of a smoother transition or softer light, it would have been a little bit harder to pull this off in 45 oh, yeah. minutes. Um, so I didn't even realize that, but now that I've gone back and analyzing this, 
uh, it makes sense to me that because of the high contrast, that actually helped me to finish this drawing mm -hmm. in the time frame. Still, still some splotchiness in the background that I would like to have evened out, obviously. Um, there are some areas in the, in the head uh, or the forehead, actually, where I really would have liked to have some of those smoothed out values uh, for sure. Uh, although the, the likeness of the person is not completely spot on, it's enough to be where if you knew this person, you would know it was a drawing of oh, that definitely, person. Oh, definitely, yeah, definitely. So um, I was pretty pleased with that uh, since... Since again, only forty-five minutes, um, and this is a subject that you could easily spend ten or twelve hours on. Oh, easy! You know, easy. easy. Yeah, there was even so, with a drawing that's just a little bit bigger right, than this. Right, there was so much information there. I mean, he right. had texture all through his hair. He had it in his skin, <laughs> and you could, you know, if you wanted to really attack that, you could spend several days doing it. So I think you got. I think it looks great. I think you got a ton of that um, texture in here for that forty-five minutes. Uh, well, thanks for that. Um, yeah, so uh, when this episode was over, I, I felt very relieved that I didn't have to dread drawing the portrait for you guys live. Um, and I know <laughs> some of you think um, that we make this kind of stuff look easy. Um, and it is definitely a lot easier when you are just recording with a camera. Um, but when you're doing things live for folks and um, it's thousands of people, uh, that can be a little bit nerve wracking. Um, to Makes do. it exciting. Um, yeah, it's a little so, bit of an adrenaline rush, <laughs> and uh, and then a, and then sort of a when it's all over, you really feel your body relax. Yeah, if, if unless you're me, because I never <laughs> Matt relax. worries I, all the time. I just <laughs> all the time. He's been doing uh, it for years. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, all right, good. We're we're almost right at seven. Yeah, I think we're doing all right on time. Yeah, we have. I know we haven't had a chance to get into the chat box and answer a lot of questions tonight, um, but we have at least made it to our tenth drawing before we've run out of time. So yeah, this I'm, I'm going to scroll through the comments there, guys, <coughs> before we're done, and I'm going to hit all the ones in capital letters okay. if I possibly can, if we have enough time. We'll have a light. We'll call it the lightning round. Lightning round. Yeah. All right. So I had done a um, I had done a tractor and some farm animals, but no produce. And uh, a lot of what we get from farms are our vegetables and our fruits. And this is one of those, an avocado, a fruit that is near and dear to my heart. You know, we talked a lot about avocados and how much we eat avocados. Um, this is pastel. And I believe, gosh, I think this was on a gray, a gray recycled paper, maybe by Strathmore. And it had a little flex of the paper in there. It was pretty smooth. It might have been the gray toned drawing paper. Yeah, I know it was gray, and I'm pretty sure it was a Strathmore paper, and, and relatively smooth, kind of too smooth for pastel. I would prefer to use um, Mitant's paper if I was going to spend a lot of time on it, but I knew I only had 45 minutes, so it was going to be a limit to how long I could build up layers. And because of that, I felt like the tooth that this paper provided would be um, sufficient for the for the amount of time we would spend on the drawing. So when I work with pastel, um, and you may have this experience, I get a little frustrated because although I have a lot of colors, um, they're never the right color. Um, but because of that, sometimes some really nice things can happen with pastel. And so I did a little bit of complaining while I was working with pastels because of that. But um, for that reason, I had to make several choices, not just a color to put in the background, but several colors to put together in the background. And, and it, it worked out really well. And so I'm, I'm always happy. It's probably, um, it's probably good that I don't have just the right pastel for what I'm looking at, or my pastel artwork would look more like a coloring book with big flat shapes of color in there. So the background actually started with some purple, and then I just kept kind of layering over it and toning that down, responding to the purple. So that was one of the things that I was happy about is the layering of the colors in the background. Um, I was also happy with the um, the, the texture that was created on the seed, ultimately, I didn't know how that was going to go. You know, this avocado seed is a dark brown, but it kind of had this, you know, it kind of has this gray, light gray or white fogginess um, to it. And uh, we were able to, with a light touch, use some broken color there to let some of that brown show through and create that sort of milky, um, translucent um, value that is over top of the brown. Also in the whole avocado, um, there's a lot of speckles and dots in there. And uh, when you have a texture like that, it's, easy, it's really easy for, for me sometimes um, to kind of go into um, factory mode or assembly line mode, you know, where I'm putting the same rivet in over and over or making the same mark 
um, every time over and over. So I was conscious of that because I've made that mistake plenty of times before um, to keep checking my reference and put some marks in that were specific to the ones that I saw in the avocado. Probably not as many and probably not in exactly the right place, but I did notice that some of those little dots weren't dots. They were dashes, and some of them had a had a little ball at the end and a line that came out of it. And just noticing the variety of the light and dark marks, I think, um, and using uh, trying to incorporate the variety into the avocado, um, I think that worked uh, pretty well. What I would have done different is definitely the contour of the avocado in the background. Um, after I made this drawing, you know, I was looking at it a little harder after I got home and uh, realized that I lost a little bit of the, um, of the organic, random um, contours that we see in nature that we wouldn't sometimes think to draw on our own. And this avocado, uh, the one in the background, the whole avocado, ended up quite a bit more symmetric um, than the one that was in the reference. And that's, a, that's, a, um, in, that's an area that I wish I had not deviated from the reference. You know, Matt and I talk about using references, but not feeling like we have to copy them. Um, but I think I, I think I did a little bit of formula drawing here, and I think I drew a green egg and then gave it texture. It's a little egg-shaped to me. It doesn't sort of have that um, flare out below the top of the point that is, um, you know, kind of common to a lot of avocados. So I, I was, uh, you know, I told myself that this is easy to draw and I'll be able to get, you know, as far as the contours go compared to something like the tractor or the horse, and I would be able to get into the color faster. And I think I rushed that a little bit. It should have taken just another 30 seconds or a minute to judge my contours and see if uh, if they needed just a little bit more variety or specificity. Well, I love uh, your background in this one. Uh, really, really, a lot of, lot of depth and color here. Mm -hmm. And also uh, purple, yellow, red, green. Was that on purpose? Complimentary, complimentary. That's how I control the intensity, yeah. <laughs> Very you know, nice. I put, a, I put a bright color down, then I tone it down with its opposite. Well, uh, you, you know, you got a complementary. I mean, you got oh, you mean close purple together? Purple and yellow, yeah. and then red and green right next to each yeah. other. That's that's adding a lot of vibrancy to the piece. Yeah, because they're, you've they're got not bright colors alone, but next to each other, they help each other to seem brighter. Right, because they're contrasting as far as color yeah. goes. And another thing uh, I really like is the the shadow here, how um, it's such a deep purple. Mm -hmm. And you use some black in there, but it's mixed with the colors really nicely. Yeah. I think with the avocado, you were talking about the shape here. Mm -hmm. I think the shape is fine. I, I, I eat avocados all the time. It doesn't bother you? Not at all. Okay. Um, I think what um, is making it feel egg-like is actually the 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 darker value right here next to the light, almost white right here. Mm -hmm, yeah. And I know in the reference, those, it was shiny. It was, it was a very it shiny was super avocado, shiny. yeah. Um, but I feel like if these were kind of a light yellow green. Yeah, that's a place where maybe I could have deviated from the reference a little bit. Then you wouldn't be thinking egg. Yeah. It's I, so you think it's just a little too cool. Yeah, The color is exactly. too cool. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think the shape's fine. Um, and I really like... I, I mentioned this when you did it, the purple right there, again, right next to a yellow. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't, you don't notice that when you're looking at the image in totality, you don't say, Hey, look, there's a, a shape of purple and one of yellow <laughs> right next to each other. Um, but it works for the piece when you see it all together. And uh, that's how, you know, that's how we use color to communicate the world around us. It's not necessarily the color that's there. It's sometimes a combination the of relationship colors. relationship of colors. Yeah, yeah that's Sometimes true. it's colors right next to each other. So uh, really nice. So, all right, I'll ask you, what was your favorite drawing that you did this season? All right, I believe my favorite drawing was the horse. And it's partly because I've, I'd never drawn a horse before. And it came out, it came, I, I love it. I think it came out great. Um, and it, I, mean, I was probably most nervous about it because I think a horse's face is more distinct than a sheep's face. It felt more mm. like a portrait, you know. Um, so I felt like if I were to make mistakes, it would be more obvious in the horse than some of the other subjects that I chose. So I was really nervous about it, and I was thrilled with the way it came out. So that's, um, that's definitely my favorite. Okay, what was uh, your favorite drawing that I drew? Gosh. You know, when I was first looking at them before the show came on, 
I was thinking it was the lips. Yeah. You know, I really like the lips. I know some of the, some of our um, friends in the chat love the is. ear. Um, but then, then when it's not I, the ear. Now, when I came up, I really liked it too. So, I'm I'm having trouble with yours. You know, I would probably go with the ear over the okay. out of those three. I would probably yeah. go with the ear just because it has that real marbly feel to it. It looks like Michelangelo made it. Mm. Oh well, that is an incredible compliment. I, I, I know. I, I if I'd have, if I'd have thought. For what I was about to say, I wouldn't even spit it out. <laughs> Matt's going to get a big head now. Yeah. Uh, all right. Um, I think my favorite that I did yeah. is actually the eye. The eye? Yeah. yeah I, I like the the way the skin circles around the eye. You yeah. know, that's one thing that really attracted me it to it. It does have kind of a feeling of, of movement going around there, doesn't it? Does, it does, yeah. Um, which is kind of weird. It's not intentional. Um, mm -hmm. And my favorite drawing that you did, what do you think it is? It's not the, the horse. The sheep. The horse is awesome. Yeah. The sheep is all the drawings. All the drawings are awesome. But there's one that I really, really like. Gosh. The rooster? Yes. All right. The is it because it's so colorful? Favorite. You like the colors and it stuff just, in there? It's so unique. It pops. Yeah, it does have a lot of pop um, to it. And I think, you know, we do so much representational stuff that, mm -hmm. you know, when you do so much representational stuff, pushing yourself outside of the boundaries of being representational is is harder. And uh, I feel like I have a greater appreciation for pieces of art that are, you know, more arty. Yeah. A little, <laughs> for lack little, of a better little word. A little more stylized. A um, little, little uh, I guess. Yeah, I guess more stylized. De where we deviate a little bit more yeah. from our references. Well, I know. think just this... Picture is is uh, electric. Yeah, I, I, I do like this one, and, I love I, and the it's shadow. Just pretty decent size too, because I was using sticks instead of pencils. So yeah. this is one that I, I have found. I do have it, and I think I might actually frame this one and put it up in our kitchen. I think it'd be a good addition to that room. All right, um, let's see here. I will try to uh, see what we can find here real quick. We got okay. literally just a, maybe a minute. Um, and everyone's putting what their favorites are on there. I wish I could go through and um, and comment on all of them all. Um, I, there's a couple of questions about the live lesson. Since yeah, there's a be question the about lesson, the paper alternative for yeah, tonight. Yeah, we'll, we'll discuss that during the live lesson. Okay. Um, because that's not really relevant in, to folks who aren't going to be in the live that's lesson. That's true. Um, and I'm scrolling through here, and I'm... All of the the comments in capital letters here. Um, they're out of context because we're going backwards. They're just comments. There's not a lot of questions yeah. besides that one for the, the live uh, lesson. But we do appreciate those comments. Yes, and, and there are. Tons I go back of them. and read these after the show's over a lot of times. Oh, here we go. Here's one. Uh, Dana asked, "Do you have any advice for drawing from imagination instead of using a reference?" Photo. Love you guys from Central North Carolina. Well, you're not too far away from us, Dan, yeah, Dana. Right. And my suggestion is to draw from observation. The more you draw from observation, you learn uh, what you can use in a drawing to create an illusion. Yeah. So uh, a lot of people think that you just can start drawing from imagination and, and people can sit down and just draw things from their imagination. No. <laughs> Usually you have, you they're have to leaning on the experience that they have from drawing from life. You know, and you when you see it happen, you're like, wow, they're just pulling this right out of their head. They're almost pulling it out of their memory from things they've drawn before. So, yes. So the more you draw from your memory, the better you're going to get. From your, from, the more yeah. you draw from life, the right. better you can draw from imagination. Right. You know what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm feeling rushed and flustered now <laughs> because we, it, I've got to get set up for uh, our live lesson here. Matt's so thinking, starting to, to think about that jellyfish now. We're going to have to wrap things up here. Um, but... Thanks, guys, for joining us here on YouTube. Um, remember, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, make sure you do that um, and uh, hit the notification bell so you're notified. Yeah. And uh, again, if you wanted to learn more about the membership program at thevirtualinstructor.com, there is a link below this video. Like this video, that will help other people find it. And uh, I know that we didn't do any drawings tonight, but looking back on your drawings and the artworks that you create and critiquing them, is, is very important. It's part of the learning process. It's part of your development as an artist. Um, and it's also a good idea to have somebody else look at your artwork who knows a little bit about drawing and painting. Yeah, I actually you. learned from listening to you talk about my artwork today because yeah. you're oh, yeah. just a different set of eyes right. you know, with yeah. different artistic inclinations. Um, so don't just go to somebody that you know and say, what do you think about my drawing? 
because they're probably going to say, oh, it's awesome. It's so nice. Uh, you need to go to somebody who's going to be a little bit critical. Yeah, go to somebody you know and say, I found this drawing that somebody else did. What do you think of it? And then maybe they'll give you their, their honest opinion. Yeah, they'll give you the honest opinion then, but it might not be something that you want to hear. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, anyway, uh, thanks again, guys. Uh, we're going to go ahead and sign out of YouTube, and then we're going to head over to the virtual instructor. But we'll see you guys back in about five or six weeks. Yeah, we will come back. Uh, it'll probably be the beginning of June. Mm -hmm. Again, if you want to be notified, make sure that you're on the newsletter list. Again, there's a link in the description below for that. It's the one for the free course videos and events. All right. Uh, good night, everybody. <laughs>